A Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste, your thoughtfulness. The makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you one of the most thrilling stories of all time, De Maupassant's A Piece of String. Our star, one of the outstanding actors of our time, Claude Rains. Yeah. Folks, the makers of Hallmark reading cards take great pride in the cards they make for you. Each Hallmark card you buy is a very personal card, a thoughtful reminder of something truly from you. That's why when you're looking for a card for any occasion at all, ask for Hallmark cards. For a Hallmark card will always say just what you want to say the way you want to say it. That's why, too, when you select your Christmas cards, visit your Hallmark dealer. For every Hallmark dealer has been carefully chosen, so you're assured of finest quality, courtesy, and friendly service. Remember, too, always to look in the back of the card you buy for the three identifying words, a Hallmark card. Three little words that tell your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And out of the side of our program, here is your Hallmark host, Les Tremaine. Thank you, Tom Shirley, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With no more ado, let me welcome to the Hallmark program once again that fine American actor, Claude Rains. Thank you, Les. I'm happy to be back. Particularly happy to be doing this magnificent story tonight. You knew the story, of course. The Maupassant's A Piece of String is one of the great stories of all time. When I read the script, I knew at once it would be an exciting part to play. Do you always know what parts are right for you? No, by no means no. But I have to know most of the time or I'd be out of business. <laughs> well, after being on the Hallmark show so many times, you ought to know the right kind of greeting cards to send. I do, Les. At least I know how to tell whether they're the right kind or not. Oh, how's that? You just look on the back. Don't you listen to the commercials on the show? <laughs> <laughs> sure. For those three little words, a Hallmark card. They tell your friends you care enough to send the very best. Excellent. You should be an announcer. <laughs> <laughs> For my money, Claude, you are about the most versatile actor on the screen. I've seen you play everything from the deepest dyed villain to the most romantic of the Caesars. Are you among my friends who assure me that I appeared to best advantage in The Invisible Man? <laughs> oh, no, no. But kidding aside, The Invisible Man was a great success. It took you to the top in Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we offer you as rich entertainment as you could dream of. A thrilling story by the master storyteller de Maupassant, played by one of the finest actors of our time. The makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you on the Reader's Digest radio edition... A Piece of String, starring Claude Rains. Somebody must believe me. It is necessary that somebody believe me. I am a simple, honest man. You can tell that. Look, here are my hands. See how strong they are, even now, the work of a lifetime. You see how the earth of France is on these hands, no matter how much I scrub them. See the big blue, blue veins, the knotted knuckles. See the way my hands are half closed, as though even now they were going to grasp the plow handles. These are the hands of an honest French peasant. And you must believe me, it is necessary that somebody believe me before I die so that the world can be told that I am innocent. Now let me tell you how it was. First, there was a quarrel with Maitre Maladin, but, but that was years before the accusation. Maitre Maladin was a harness maker. Yes, and I tell you, Maitre Ashton, never have I made a better hold of. Yeah, but you have done a poor job of work for me. I am a man who puts his soul in his work, and you can't accuse me of such a thing. Yes, a bit of peasant like myself cannot afford to pay for things unless he has received full value. My price is my price, and I will not change it. You be as stubborn as you like, monsieur. You know very well I can be just as stubborn. Mm. Well, uh, I don't agree, my I am cheating myself, but, well, I can shave off a few sous. Do I have to point out that a halter, which is no good at one price, is still no good at another? But I can never get rid of this halter to anyone else. I do not care. It is not my fault. It is your fault for making the halter badly to begin with. Bet! You paid. You will pay for this halter. You'll pay for more than this halter. I'll make you pay, and pay dearly. <laughs> There it is. 
That is why Maitre Maladin did not speak to me, and that is why I had my harness made in the village of Gouradil. Maitre Maladin and I are not so very unlike. He wanted my money, I wanted my money. We quarreled about it, that is all. We are both frugal men, and we are both men of sense. We would not quarrel about anything but money. Nobody in our province would quarrel about anything but money. There are women everywhere, but to make money, a man must make a real effort. It was the day of the fair in Goodwill, many years later. It was the day that ruined my life. I had walked to Goodwill to get to this fair. Sometimes when one walks, one has good fortune. There are many things to be found in the dust of a country road. A button, a scrap of metal, a comb. Many things that careless people and foolish people throw away. But everything has value. I always pick up everything. Now, most peasants in my province pick up whatever they can find. On this day, as I entered the fairgrounds, I saw on the ground a piece of string. A long piece of string. Long enough so that one might tie up a bundle with it. I stooped down to get it. Hello there. Stingy one. It was Malada. Picking something up, huh? Well, do you care? Is it your business to spy on me? And what great thing of value have you got this time, stingy one? Some broken glass, an old tooth. Oh, oh, yeah, that's it. Don't let me see it. Close your hand over it. Hide it from me. Don't share it with me. Don't share this thing worth thousands of francs. <laughs> His words stunned me. Ever since he had made the bad halter for me and I had refused to take it, he had shouted at me, Stingy and Miser. To cover my confusion, I kept pretending to search for something in the road. Mullard, I just laughed and finally went off to tell others unpleasant things about me. I went in the opposite direction, wandering in the fair and looking at the exhibits until I came to where they were auctioning a cow. Have you missed Here's a fine animal. Bring the look cover, brown of eye and heavy of honor. A healthy beast that will provide milk for you and all your kids. Who will give me a thousand francs for this fine cow? The cow is old, skinny, dried up. Come, monsieur. Who would bid one thousand francs? I will bid one hundred francs. <laughs> <laughs> Who will bid two hundred francs? One hundred and five francs. One hundred and six. Let those go and bid one hundred and six. Who will bid two hundred? I was safe. The bidding on an animal like this was sure to reach 175 francs. Meanwhile, I could experience the excitement of being a bidder. I could plunge wildly. 120! 121! I could speak large sums, and the pulse would pound in my throat, and my stomach would tighten. I could plunge wildly, and it would not cost me a sou. 130! 135! And 36! Well, I scarf bidding on a cow. I have 136! Who will make it 200? 140. 141. I have 141. Stop, stop, Mr. Auctioneer, stop. I have something to say. I have a great suggestion. Metoshkorn has bid 141 francs. You were Metapero. You were about to bid higher? Yes, I was. Well, don't. All of you, stop bidding. Let Metoshkorn have this cow. If he wants it. Just one moment. I have a cow to sell. I'm not going to stop the... Ah, uh, but listen to me. Surely we all know Metroshkov. Surely we've all seen him bidding many times. On cows and furniture and poultry. Always Metroshkov bids. But he never wins the bidding. Malaga, be quiet. What's the matter, Oshkov? Monsieur Auctioneer, you others, you, you... Do not listen to this man. He is my enemy. He he, he made a bad halter for me. Well, oh, Scott, do you want the bidding to go on? Yes, I do. When you've won your cow for a mere 141 francs. Well, well, I... I want to be fair to these other gentlemen. What if they do not want to bid any longer? I don't want to bid any longer. No, I... I don't want to. None of us is going to bid anymore. Well, Monsieur Auctioneer. Well, I have 141 francs for Metro Oshkosh. 141 francs going. No. Going... Go on, you missed one. No, 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 no. It, it was a mistake. A mistake? But you bid. It was a mistake. I, I had another animal in mind. I am in the wrong place. <laughs> so, there it is. I had to leave the auction 
Behind me, the crowd still laughed, and some of them shouted at me. I stumbled as I hurried away, and believe me, there were tears in my eyes. Malada had spoiled my innocent pleasure. Why, sir? Malada had made me the butt of ridicule, a laughing stock. Stinky! Remember this. It is important to what came later. It is important to know that Major Maladon was malicious, that he would do anything to injure me. I went close to the bandstand and listened for a while, but finally I turned away and headed for the agricultural exhibits. Metro Scum! It, it was... It was Marius Pomel who called me. Metro Scum! How are you? Marius Pomel was a stupid boy. Uh, Metro Scum, wait for me. I did not want to be seen with Marius Pomel. I did not want people to think I consulted with... Simple boys. Well, Maitre Oscar, I've had difficulty catching up he with you. He grasped my arm, but I jerked it away from him and stared in, indifferently in the other direction. I, I wanted to ask you something. I started walking, but the poor fool only walked along beside me. When will you be leaving to go back home, Maitre Oscar? I did not answer him. I had nothing to say to this stupid fellow. Well, will you be leaving early in the afternoon or late in the afternoon, Maitre Oscar? How, how could I get rid of him? I would like to walk back with you when you leave. Could I Could I get him interested in what was going on in some booth and then leave him when he wasn't looking? I've asked everybody to walk back with me. Nobody can do it. I asked Maître Breton. I asked Maître Jourdain. I asked everybody. All of them are going to be busy. Nobody can walk back with me. Well, Maître Oshkan and Marius Pommel. It was Malada. Everywhere I went this day, there was Malada. I see you found your level of companionship, Matoshka. This was intolerable. Malada now had one more thing to trick me about. <laughs> A very perfect pair. Matoshka and Marius Pomel. Uh, Maître Malada, perhaps you would walk home with me. Maître Oshka does not answer me, and all the others find reasons why they cannot. Could you walk home with me, Maître Melanda? Ah. Melanda turned on his heel and walked rapidly away. Maître Melanda, you did not answer my question. As the boy called after Melanda, I myself walked rapidly away and made my escape. <laughs> that summoned us to lunch. I ran. Everybody ran. I ran until my heart was bursting. There were not seats enough in the dining room. Everybody, so I ran. I was rewarded. I got a seat. It was, it was so good in the dining room. A great fireplace filled with bright flames cast a lively heat on me. Three spits were turning, loaded with chickens, pigeons, and legs of mutton. There was a cider on the table. They were serving pea soup. It did not cost much. I was happy. I was happy. It was the last time I was to be happy in my life. Attention, please. It is hereby made known that there was lost this morning on the road to Birdfield between 9 and 10 o'clock a black letter pocketbook containing 500 francs and some business papers. The finder is requested to return the same with all haste to the mayor's office or to make a break of Mandil. A reward of 20 francs will be paid. That is all. 20 francs! Everybody around me began to talk at the event, discussing what chances Maitre Aoul Blake had of getting back his money. It was very exciting for me to think of a man losing that great amount of money. Five hundred francs! It was incredible! The soup ran down over my chair as I thought of it. Is Maitre Oscar of Weyote here? Uh, me, monsieur? Are you Maitre Oscar? Why, yes, monsieur. Would you come with me, please? Where, monsieur? To the mayor's office. To Monsieur le Maire's office, me? Yes, the mayor would like to speak to you. Monsieur le Maire would like to speak to me, but why? You will find that out. Yes, but... Come, Mr. come, I have not all day. Oh, very well, monsieur, I come, I come, I come. But first, first let me get back the money I have paid for this lunch. Here I am, Monsieur le Maire. Here I am. You are Maître Oshko? Yes, Monsieur le Maire. Sit down. Yes. You entered the fairgrounds this morning by the Burzville Road. Didn't you, Maître Oshko? Yes, Monsieur. There you found the pocketbook lost by Maître Ulbrecht of Montville. Monsieur, what are you saying? 
was saying that you were seen this morning to pick up on the road to Buzzview the pocketbook in question. Me? Me? You see, me, me pick up the pocketbook? Yes, you. Oh, word of honor, Miss Lima. I know nothing about it. But you were seen. I was seen, me? Monsieur, no, 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 no. Who, who saw me? Maître Melandin, the horse maker. Ah, Melandin. I will have to arrest you, Maître Hoshkorn. <laughs> back in just a moment with the second act of tonight's drama from the pages of the Reader's Digest, America's favorite magazine, presented by the makers of Hallmark Cards, America's favorite greeting cards. And now here's Tom Shirley. Folks, it's time to introduce the Hallmark Doll of the Week. She's a gay new doll of nursery fame, straight from land of make-believe. Who is she? Why, is the clue? I'm a little girl with a little curve, and I'm from the land of make-believe. Yes, the new Hallmark Doll of the Week is Little Girl with a Curl. Oh, she's a darling. As gay as all the other Hallmark Dolls from Land of Make Believe. She's the answer for youngsters who are waiting for another Hallmark Doll to add to their collection. She's the answer, too, for you when you want to send fun and happiness to youngsters anywhere. Like other Hallmark Dolls, she's gaily dressed front and back, wears a real feather in her hat. And inside, there's another one of those merry stories in rhyme that youngsters love so much. Yes, folks... Be sure and get Hallmark Dolls. Get Little Girl with a Curl for your youngster's collection now. And now here once again is your Hallmark host, Best for Maine. Our program continues now with the second act of tonight's moving drama, A Piece of String, starring Claude Rains. <laughs> piece of string, that's all. Just a piece of string. When Monsieur Le Maire accused me, I tried to tell him that. I tried to make him understand. Listen, Monsieur Le Maire, I said it was, it was just a piece of string. Maître Maladin saw me pick up just a piece of string. You will not make me believe, Maître Oshkorn, that Maître Maladin, who is a man of standing in this community, mistook a piece of string for a pocket. No, look, 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 Monsieur, here. Here is the string. Here. Here in my pocket. See? Here it is. Anyone can have a piece of string in his pocket. But nobody, nobody, Met Oshkorn, would stoop to pick up a piece of string lying in the road. Well, any prudent man would do so, any peasant, anyone from this province. What you picked up was a pocket for oh, no, Monsieur. Metro Melandin has told us that you went on looking a long while in the mud to see if any piece of money had fallen out. It is true that I remained bent over for some time, but it was only because I was hiding from Metro Melandin the fact that it was a piece of string that I was picking up. Ah, uh -huh. Now you hang with your own excuse. Because no man, Mr. Oshkorn, no man, I say, would have to hide the fact that he was picking up an innocent piece of string. If you were trying to deceive Mr. Melandin, it was in regard to a pocketbook. Come in, Mr. Melandin. Mr. Melandin, will you repeat for Mr. Oshkorn what you have told me about what you saw? Everything I saw, I saw. And I've told the truth about it. That's how Scorn tried to keep me from seeing. But it was the pocketbook he found. Liar. Enough. Mr. Oshkorn, since you do not voluntarily hand over the pocketbook, I must have you searched. But of course there was nothing to find on me. Nothing but the piece of string which I had already shown to them and some paper I'd folded up and kept because it might be useful if I ever had a bundle to wrap. I had some coins too, but nothing else. No pocketbook. Certainly not 500 francs. Well, I suppose I must release you, Metro Oshkorn. But I will consult the public prosecutor about further proceedings. When I left the town hall, I found that everybody knew of what had happened. Hey, Oshkorn! I hear you've come into money. <laughs> Matt Oshkorn, could you lend me, say, two or three hundred francs? <laughs> he should lend that money to Matt Ramel and Dan to shut his mouth about it. No, 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 my friends. Now, listen to me. You don't understand any of you. It was only a little piece of string I picked up. Please, please believe me. Maitre Maladin lied. Oh, how, any, how 
how anyone, how anyone can tell such lies to take away a man's reputation. He lied on you. This is only a piece of string. A little piece of string. A little piece of string. I sold out two friends of mine. I showed them the spot where I found the piece of string. Yes. Yes, we see the spot. We admit it's there. But that doesn't prove that it wasn't a pocketbook that you found there. So, that was how my friends felt about it. In the whole world, there was nobody who would believe me innocent. I walked home, alone. Every once so often, someone would overtake me and I would turn to him. <laughs> they all laughed at me. I reached home. I had some onion soup and I, I lay down. But I could not sleep. I kept thinking... How can I make all these people believe that it was only a little piece of string that I picked up? A piece of string. Towards dawn, I was, I was numb with thinking and fatigue, so I fell asleep. I don't know how long it was before I was awakened. Oh, oh. Ah, all right, all right. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Matushko, my dear friend. What, monsieur, you... You call me your friend, you? Oh, I do, and I want you to get dressed and come to the fair with me. I will never go to the fair again. But why not? They laugh at me there. Who oh, they did yesterday. They think I am a, a, a dishonest there. They did yesterday, but look, my friend, I have news for you. Today, today, Marius Pomer, that stupid boy, turned in the pocketbook to the officers of the mayor. What are you saying? Well, it's true. He found it in the room, not far from where you found the piece of string. He returned it to the mayor. You're free, my friend. <laughs> That did not matter. I had known they could never arrest me since they had not found the pocketbook on me. But something else mattered. People would have to believe me now. People would not laugh. I could go to the fair. I could walk among my neighbors. And they would honor me once again as an honest man. I am sorry you did not believe me yesterday, but you, you did not really listen to me. Uh, we'll listen now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my friends. I'll tell you what happened. I came along the road, walking to the fair, and I saw in the dust of the road a piece of string. A little innocent piece of string. Now, what prudent man would not pick up a piece of string? What prudent man would not pick up a pocketbook? Uh-huh. Well, I know, so it... Uh, I... Yes, monsieur. You said I didn't see you yesterday. Oh, no. You saw me. You tried all day to make me miserable. You created a scene at the auction of the cow. And was it only at the auction of the cow that I saw you? No, you saw me pick up the piece of string. I saw you pick up something. And then later I saw you where? Why, you're talking to Marius Pomer. Ah, Matt Oshko. You weren't talking to Marius Pomer, were you? Well, I... I don't know whether I talked to him or not. I was... I was with him. But Pomel is the one who returned the pocketbook to the mayor and collected the reward. Oh, How much of the reward did you let Pomel keep, <laughs> Mr. Ashka? Keep a reward? What are you talking about? I tell you, I, I found nothing to be rewarded for. I found only a little piece of string. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a piece of string, I tell you. It was only a little piece of string. There it is. No one would believe me. Everywhere I went, they laughed at me. I walked back to my home. The next day, I had some visitors with some of my neighbors, and they laughed. They, they called me an old fox. And since then, it has been that way for months, for a year. Look, I, I know it would be a clever trick if one found the pocketbook and was accused to have the boy return it. But that is not what I did. You must believe me. I, I've stayed at home for so long. I've let my fields go. Not tilled. I'm ashamed to go to the store. I have not eaten. That is why I'm sick now. I have not eaten. That is why I am about to die. Oh, I know. I heard the doctor say I was I was going to die. The old rascal is going to kick the bucket, he said. I don't want that doctor to be paid. I heard him. I hear everything lying here. I hear things you cannot hear. I hear them in the village, in the store, in the fields, in the dining hall, at the fairgrounds. Listen to me, will you? You must believe me. It was only a little piece of string. It was only a little piece of string.
Thank you, Claude Rains. I don't think any of us will forget the unlucky French peasant you played for us tonight. That was a great performance. Thank you, Les. It was a real experience for me. What's coming up next? A quite a different kind of story. A story of a priest and a murderer. And what happened when they met. Sounds like a thriller. Well, it's more than that. It's one of those stories you hear with your heart. Who's your guest star? A very able and popular young man, John Garfield. Johnny? Johnny, I certainly won't miss Johnny in a story like that. I'll be listening. We hope you all will, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, when the makers of Hallmark Greeting Cards present from the pages of the Reader's Digest the amazing story of Death Across the Table, starring John Garfield. <laughs> Dolls from the land of make-believe are greeting cards you can send for every occasion. But more, they're lovable dolls of nursery fame. Young folks love them, want to collect a Hallmark doll every week. So folks, to make a hit with youngsters anytime, get colorful Hallmark dolls. They're only 25 cents. Now how else could you send so much happiness for so little? Only with Hallmark dolls. Remember to listen next week. See who the next Hallmark doll of the week will be. <laughs> by Robert Senadella from the famous story by Gidi Mopasak, which was reprinted in the Reader's Digest, America's favorite magazine. The Hallmark program was directed by Mark Loeb, with music especially composed by Jack Miller. To be doubly sure of the finest quality, always look in the back of your cards for those three identifying words, a Hallmark card. This is Tom Shirley speaking for the makers of Hallmark reading cards. Remember, a Hallmark card will best express your perfect taste your thoughtfulness. And now, this is your Hallmark host, Les Tremaine, saying good night to you all until next week at the same time. See you then. Today, we'll save lives tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WBBS.